Okay, we're back. Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech here on a given Thursday. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called Fresh Back from China. Ho oh, ho, it's a conference in China. We're gonna talk about on the ground, how well is China emulating the American way of life and the way of academic life and why the Chinese and how hard the Chinese are working to emulate our way of life. If you want to ask a question or participate in discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 808-437-2014. Our guest for the show is Elizabeth Satoris of Chaminade, Chaminade University, visiting professor uh, in wait, I get it, wait, That's business right. and business and... Not visiting, in residence. In residence, <laughs> professor, pardon me. He's been, been there a long time. <laughs> You've been residing there a long time. <laughs> business uh, and, uh, and communications in yeah. Cheminade. And somewhere along the line, she decided and had this opportunity to go back to China because she was there in 1993. Like 73. 73, oh, 73. Let me think, that was right after the Cultural Revolution. During the end of it. During the end of the yeah. Cultural Revolution. And now she goes back in 2017. Can you imagine how your <laughs> mind is blown by looking at China after that period? I, I just want to tell you, I, I went to China first time in 2003 or four, um, and I, it blew my mind. The, the energy, uh, all these people moving at a high high rate of speed, doing everything they did at a high rate of speed. It was just, it was completely a mind blower to go there, and it changes you when you go to China. You realize that there's another side to this world, and it's a world of tremendous energy. They they have uh, something je ne sais quoi that is not <laughs> duplicated anywhere else. <laughs> so let's talk about why you went in the first place, and why you went back. Right. Well, the, the first time I went, I was a part of a delegation of science for the people scientists. And we were invited by the National Science Association of China. And uh, they gave us an incredible six-week tour in 1973, still cultural revolution time. Uh, the streets filled with people, that energy you described. There were more people in the streets then than now, mm. if you can believe it. Now they're in their middle class <laughs> housing, right? Relaxing now themselves, watching television. TV, so. <laughs> 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 you, if you turned around in the streets of Shanghai, suddenly you'd see a thousand people following you because they hadn't seen any of us long noses in their whole lives. Uh, so uh, Joe and Lai was, was uh, in part responsible for at least he was responsible for alerting certain people in the government that I was there because he had invited a friend of mine from New York the, in 1971. And then Nixon came in 72 and we went in 73. Wow, that was history making. Part of that trip we rode Westlake, in, in the you're train right on the car they made Westlake. for Nixon. Yeah. Uh, it had pale blue velvet upholstered seats, blonde wood, white lace curtains. Uh, and whatever cars they had at the time, they all had white lace curtains on the windows <laughs> and only professional drivers. Uh -huh. So there were a handful of them. Yeah. Well, when I went back uh, now, uh, interestingly, I, I saw my Honolulu friends, uh, uh, Xiaofang and uh, Roger. Mm -hmm. Roger <laughs> Epstein. Epstein. Your, Roger Epstein, 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 depending on his mood. <laughs> <laughs> and Xiaofang North. Uh, Michael's wife. Michael has a show here at Think Tech. And uh, so uh, Xiaofang came down from Beijing to meet me in Shanghai, where my first Xiaofang conference Xiaofang is related was. to Zhou Enlai, too. She is what his great niece. What a tremendous connection that and is. And she loved the idea that I, I uh, had visit, had meetings with government people in, the, in China then because of Zhou Enlai, and that now she, as great niece of Zhou and Lai, was going to welcome me back. She's trying to get me to come live with her in Lovely. Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the only thing recognizable in Beijing was the, was Tiananmen Square, which they still don't allow cars to cross. So it's still this wide open expanse. And then that old government building is still there with the big picture of Mao on it. And uh, so, I, of course, I got my picture taken there. Of course. Um, <laughs> Mao in the background, of course. Yeah, Mao in the background. <laughs> I was hoping for one with Joe and Lai. We did find a Joe and Lai picture in the oh, store. Oh, Joe and Lai, window. you're not going to find him living, though. Neither one. Neither one. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're both uh, looking on from elsewhere. Yeah. But they are, you know, strong figures in China. They're both. Yes. 
beloved, uh, res respected figures um, even now mm. today. Well, Joe and Lai, especially as the great peacekeeper, uh, peacekeeper and internationalist of yeah. China, yeah. Uh, uh, was very much loved, and and he was an extraordinary person. So. Uh, you know, we'll soon have that film in the footsteps of Joe and Lai out that the North are making. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, I know they've been working on it for some time. They have been working on it for a long time. Yeah. So the first conference I went to was in Shanghai, and it, thought it was a actually a prep conference for a bigger one the first week of October. And uh, the name of them both is Consciousness, Science, Technology, Society covers a lot of ground. A lot of ground. Uh, the framework is consciousness. And what we found is a great hunger among people in China to talk about things like consciousness. What does it mean to become more conscious in your world? And, and how does that going to affect our future? And what happens when we look at society from that consciousness raising perspective? And when we look at technology for can it assist us in evolving our consciousness? And, um, you know, so this is, this is a fascinating... When you're talking about consciousness, you're not talking about self-awareness. That's not it. It's awareness of the world. Awareness of what is happening of around you. There's in, individual in the consciousness and, in this, there, in you the know, community. what we call spiritual awakening, yeah. things like ah, that. Yeah, that too. So it is somewhat oh, yes. personal. Yes, and some of the technology that was uh, talked about there was, was like uh, virtual reality and... Uh, devices that you can put on that will drive your brain waves into a deeper meditation. Uh, some of that looks a little bit to me like instant enlightenment. Who's, who's putting uh, this on? <laughs> uh, the, the CSTS conference is hosted by uh, a wonderful lady named Wendy Ma, who has a Buddhist center in the middle of Shanghai on a lovely tree-lined street. And um, she is, is uh, hosting for 10 years consciousness conferences that are organized by my friend Gino Yu in Hong Kong together with Wendy herself and a team of us, including myself. Um, so We're talking about global connections here. Yeah. You know, Elizabeth has global connections. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a planet person. <laughs> moved to Hawaii from Spain, and I've lived in Greece and South America and Canada and other places. It shows. And I have some kind of destiny with China, it seems. I think uh, a lot of people do. I, I think China is, um, is magnetic, you know. It draws yes, you in. It does draw you in. And uh, as for um, the conference now, we're excited about it. The one in, on the, in the first week of October will be held in the great uh, Shanghai Expo Center. Mm -hmm which has like 3,000 people sure, auditoriums sure it's huge. and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I hope we'll get a really good turnout for this. And it's very, very interesting to see the, the ravenous interest in this kind of new world thinking, you know, that uh, uh, many of us so are it's, involved It's not in. just, you know, I mean, we know that there's a lot of interest in American academia in China. I mean, there's a lot of exchange back and forth in that way. And, and I'm, I'm not even talking about the political aspect at all. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the people. We're talking yes. about the culture. Right. We're talking mm -hmm. about the people on the street. And we know there's a lot of interest, uh, you know, in, I guess, um, in, in Americans. You know, you, you f I'm sure you found them, as yeah. I did, very friendly yes. and warm and, and connecting. You know, they connect yeah. with you. And, and good sense of humor and all that. It's, it's yeah, I think it's always <coughs> been a great interest in seeing people from the outside come in and learning about other cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, I was surprised at how few Chinese actually spoke English because when I was there 44 years ago in 1973, all the young people were learning English from radio broadcasts every day. Yep. So I thought they'd all be speaking yeah. English. And, by they, now. and they practice on you. They, 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 they grab you. They come to you and they introduce themselves and, and practice they their did English. Then. <laughs> uh, yes, they did then, yeah. yeah. Uh, not as much, I found now. They, now they already know the language. Right. It's taught in all the schools. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, in, in Beijing, I, uh, I saw the giant shopping malls and things like that. And, I mean, they have a, one whole shopping mall just for knockoffs. <laughs> and, I have, and nobody I, minds. I have to say, my favorite, my favorite label on a little scarf I bought for $2 was 
100% silk feeling polyester. <laughs> silk feeling polyester. Okay, if that's, what, if that's what turns you on. <laughs> it reminds me of an old radio show in which there, a woman got a pair of genuine simulated pearls. <laughs> right, same thing. <laughs> But you know, you mentioned something, and I want to pursue that because that is, you know, the, the driving force of our show, is um, you know their interest in the American culture, uh, in the American community, because they know a lot about us. But it seems to me, and from what you say, I think I'm I'm right to assume that, is that they want to know more about how we think, how we live, how we think, our quality of life, our quality of mm, mm, uh, our quality of life, our daily style of living and they want to know about that and maybe uh, you can have to tell me but uh, maybe they want to emulate that to some extent in their own community well, yes in a way it almost felt like we've moved in on them no no I no, mean, no. You, well it's you, more curiosity talk, than anything I'm, yeah. I'm talking about on the surface when you walk into a mall and there's a bigger starbucks than any you've ever seen and a bigger subway and all of all of the american shops it's almost like as if we were transported uh in a bigger version Except of ourselves. Everything is bigger, yeah. isn't it? Everything but is bigger. Everything is bigger. You know, I used to think that big things were in Texas, you know, but no, <laughs> nothing. In well, China, things are really uh, big. I remember in London when they went down to medium, they were going to get rid of all this super size American stuff, and they were advocating medium everything. Right? How refreshing. Now, now with China is super size to our super size, yeah, really. so uh, gigantic size, whatever. Well, I, what I saw was, you know, there is this consumer frenzy now. It's new and it's very shiny and it's very glamorous to be shopping till you drop. And they're, they're pushing that in China. On the other hand, what I see on the more serious side is a real interest in our more forward ways of thinking, how to evolve our culture beyond what it is today in good, healthy ways. Yeah, well, what and do you mean, uh, healthy foods, uh, healthy li lifestyle? Yes, meditation, mm. yoga, mm. all of these things. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. That's the name of the conference. And they're reviving their own Taoist practices and Qigong ah, and Tai ah, Chi ah. And, and stuff like that. You see a lot of that. And the government is supporting that. The government does not ob Absolutely. object to that. You know. No, no, that is supported. Let's take a, a short break, Elizabeth. And when we come back, I'd like to look at some of your photos. We'll have a little yeah. photo album, a little tour through Elizabeth's photo album. <laughs> we'll be right back after this short break. You'll see. I promise. We'll be here. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Aloha, I'm Tim Apichaw, host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show's dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live with Elizabeth Satoru. She's a professor, a doctor professor at Shamanad. Uh, she is a professor in residence uh, in the School of Business and Communications there. And she just came back from a trip to China to a special conference. And we want to find out what she did because, you know, she's the kind of person, she's a global person. She thinks in global terms and connections. And I guess the best way to express that is with some pictures. <laughs> so, Elizabeth, let's look at your photo album, or at least some of them that you brought back and gave to us about what you were doing in China. <laughs> There's you. So tell us about it. Can I talk? Oh, that's it. That's in one of the, the traditional streets that's still been preserved in Beijing. The there's, there's very little of that. They call it the and, Hutan, right? And we're on our way to uh, a, a set of hot tubs 
that uh, where you fl that float you, right? <laughs> it, in in the 1950s, when I was a graduate student, they were sensory deprivation tanks, okay. and now they've become meditation tanks. <laughs> and I think that's a very interesting turning of swords into plowshares, yeah, right. so to speak. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> OK, go ahead yeah, and let's one. look at something. And this is the glitzy shopping mall view, right? So yeah, uh, these are view. these shiny white floors for miles and miles of them. You know, you could live in there and not lack for anything it's except. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you can breathe in them because the air is nice right, and fresh. Right, better than there than it is outside. They're pumping good outside air. Outside, you need in a, in a, in right. an oxygen mask. Go ahead, move on. <laughs> There's Xiaofang uh, and myself. Some people will recognize uh, her. Okay. And there's our friend Roger, Roger, okay. and, Roger and, and this is, is in uh, an area of, of Shanghai where there's a beautiful replication of traditional buildings in a, in a giant mall that's all these very lovely traditional buildings. Yeah, they call it Chinatown. Canal. <laughs> China, no, really. Probably. Chinatown in Shanghai is <laughs> yeah. what it is, with all these Chinese, okay. old classical Chinese Go ahead. buildings. Yeah. Um, this is my favorite picture, I think. It's a friend of Xiaofang. Uh, uh, a couple have a big Canadian school, an English language school for Chinese children, and we visited there. Really and that cool was fun to see that. Yeah, and this is my favorite food dog picture. Uh, <laughs> and th this is a typical sort of uh, shopping street in, in that mall, the Chinatown mall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, and this is a very interesting man named Bronislav Vinogradsky. And he is a shaman from Russia. You see his arms are full of jade and, and uh, amber necklaces. Uh, Xiaofang really drooled over those. And he's working with me on developing a Taoist seminar because he's a Russian sinologist. For over 40 years, he's been translating the most ancient Chinese documents. And being a deeply trained shaman from, you know, Siberian style, he could tune in to Lao Tzu and these original authors and claims that there is no, are no good translations of these documents mm -hmm. around. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing his Russian version in English so that I can read the closest oh, thing sure. to those really original documents, wouldn't that you be? Know, and, and a footnote to that is there are a lot of Russians in China. <clears throat> there are Russian neighborhoods and communities. There are Russian stores and restaurants and where people speak Russian. I didn't and they, see and they those. came from Russia a long time ago, and uh -huh. they were permitted to settle. And they have, and they have a whole subculture in Russian in Beijing, for example. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Is that the last one? No. Uh, now that the guy in the pink shirt there, he is Gino Yu, who is the instigator of the whole. Consciousness Science Technology Society Conference. And these are pretty much, along with Xiaofang, who came to visit me there, the other gals uh, and guy are the or organizing team helpers for the, the conferences. This is in a, the lobby of a five-star hotel as, Sheng, as Xiaofang and I are just off to Beijing for a few days. Mm -hmm. This is in Beijing trip. or Shanghai? Shanghai. That's Shanghai. one thing about Pudong. Yeah. Pudong has the most incredible hotels in the world. I mean, unbelievable hotels yeah. with oh, yeah. spectacular yeah. views. Yeah. And the picture behind and us is, is a picture of Shanghai. Of, yeah. of Pudong, I believe that is. Yeah. And, and at, uh, coming right out of your head there, that tower. <laughs> <laughs> the tower, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, the wonderful thing about China is when they make a decision, they can carry out, implement it overnight almost. And right now, they are doing more to build for a clean, green, technological world than anyone else in the world, making more solar panels and stuff. And, and now, instead of the instant cities looking only like, you know, a batch of skyscrapers with no green at all, they're, they're building a model forest city where, where steep hills are covered with buildings in between dense growth of trees and gardens and growing its own food and stuff. So they're, they're getting with it, you know, and once they ca that catches on, they can put a thousand of those across the map in no time at all, yeah. rather than some of the ghost cities uh, that were built because local politicians were getting credits for massive building projects without even thinking very hard about how to populate them. Right. Uh, <laughs> I remember going to Tianjin. Yeah. 
in one of my trips to China, Tianjin is a tech uh, center, a tech uh, mm -hmm. park, um, sort of near Beijing, maybe a couple of hundred miles east of Beijing. It's a city, mm -hmm. and in, in the city is the park. And, and as we drove through this huge, huge tech park, you could look through the buildings. You could look right through them. There was nobody inside. Yeah. There were modern glass yeah, buildings, yeah. and you could see from one side to the other. Yeah. They were building kind of on spec, mm -hmm. thinking that the tech well, industry would come there. Well, I think it was a, call it building for credits, you know, yeah. for, for political credits, yeah. because you make the GDP go up by having these massive sure. construction projects. Sure. But they're learning. You know, this is all new, and they are a very ancient culture. And my interest is how much can we revive that ancient culture in good modern ways? And one of my, my dreams is that, that Taoism be recognized as a science, not as a religion so much as a science. Why do you say that? Why is it a science? When I first saw that yin-yang symbol, I knew that they understood the cosmos the way our Western physicists still don't. That, to me, is the, the endless spiraling outward of radiation and inward of gravitation coming through each other, sort of think of a donut, where you're standing on it, and it spirals in on one side and out on the other, right, to create itself. So I knew they understood the universe as cyclic, as eternally now, as ever creating itself from within. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we have a linear universe from a big bang to no thingness, uh, <laughs> which just isn't going to hold water that much longer, I don't think. That standard model of physics in our culture has led to wonderful technologies, but it has not led to an understanding of life. And I held some, some Foundations of Science symposia on Western science, Vedic science from India, Islamic science, and now I want to do Taoist science because Western science gives us a material universe. Vedic science gives us a conscious universe. Islam gives us a living universe, surprise to me, and Taoism puts humanity square into that universe of nature. How do humans fit themselves into nature appropriately? That's what I want to see in this world. And I think China could lead the way if they get over a little bit the consumer feeding frenzy and, and move into what they will be really good at to build. Yeah. A so, and you know, they're, they're not a hostile culture. As you said, they're a friendly culture. They may be buying up the world, but they're not leveling well, they it. They have you a know? manifest destiny you know, that's rooted yeah. in the 19th century yeah. where people took advantage of yeah. them, and they're trying to yeah. stand up now. Yeah. And they are indeed standing up. But what I get is mm -hmm. a kind of conflict, though. I mean, there's um, the consumer economy, mm -hmm. and that's national policy. Let's have a consumer economy. Mm -hmm. We want uh, Chinese consumers to buy Chinese goods. We want to turn the, you know, the economy mm -hmm. uh, faster and faster. At the same time, you're talking about a pretty profound change in thinking, mm -hmm. uh, emulating American thinking and lifestyle to some extent. Maybe that's part of the consumer thing, um, but also, um, you know, thinking thinking broad, thinking philosophically, mm -hmm. thinking. Uh, and I, I wouldn't use the word religion because I don't think the Chinese government likes religion particularly. Right. But they do like they do permit, you know, philosophical thinking. And so what we have here is an openness and an ability to change yeah. by the people, and I suppose, yes. arguably, by the government, yes. too. It's all in change. Yes. Uh, and people recognize, welcome, mm -hmm. support, you mm -hmm. know, participate in change. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the same as in the United States. I, I'm not sure that we have it's the same different. sense of it. What yeah. do you think? No, I, I think it's very different. In, in, in our culture right now, we've got a huge political divide and a huge educational divide. And I don't think that divide is as strong in China. There is some elitism now. You know, in 73, everybody who graduated from high school had to spend two years in low-level jobs within the economy, you know, working in factories or waiting on tables and things. And then their work group, their peers, had to recommend them to go for higher education to make sure they would go to higher education to serve their society rather than to aggrandize themselves. And I met one woman teaching uh, MBA programs in China. She was a Dutch woman. I met her in Holland. And she said it took eight years to move the Chinese students from wanting to serve their society to wanting to climb the corporate ladder. So that's what we taught them. And that's, 
I'm sorry about that, that we taught them that aspect but of our culture. But they learned about education. But they'll figure it out. I think education was not as critical, important, personal education, education about mm -hmm. the world, or education looking outward. It was not as important in uh, 1973 as mm -hmm. it is now. I think that the individual ch Chinese uh, is going to want to educate himself or herself yes. as much as possible. Yes. I remember meeting people who spent their whole lives trying to educate themselves. Mm -hmm. They'd go to school, they, they'd run out of money, they'd work, they'd gain some money, they'd go back to school and on and on. Mm -hmm. Iteration after iteration, mm -hmm. merely to you know follow the educational thread. And I think that is a very valuable point for them. Yes. I, I agree with you. It's for self-aggrandizement more than serving the state. Well, but that's, that's a, but, a but relatively that's okay. small but part of the population. To, you right? want to be a better yeah. person. You yeah. want to be a more educated yes. person, and you want to be a more global yes. person. Yes. And indeed, this whole trip sounds very global to yes. me. And frankly, Elizabeth, they you are. sound very global. I never saw you in such a global <laughs> mode as I see you now. <laughs> well, I love this planet. I am a planet person. I'm an evolution biologist and futurist. I'm a people watcher. I'm looking for how we can evolve into our cooperative mode. And I believe China is going to play a very, very important role in that. Wow, what a yeah, trip, what a yeah, thought. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you, Jay. Always fun being with you. I want to do you. this again, as always. <laughs> okay. Aloha. Sai Jin. Xie Xie.